All right, so welcome back folks. Here we are with lesson four in this how to start a startup or how to start a business series. And before we progress any further, lesson four is all about important questions that you're gonna to wanna to ask either before or whilst you're doing everything that we discussed in lesson three and prior to that in lesson two. If you remember in lesson two, what we discussed is very loosely how to determine if your idea can actually be a business. In lesson three, we gave an overview of the different types of legal structures you can incorporate as and now in lesson four, before we go any further, some questions we want to have answered are number one, who are going to be the founders or the co-founders, if you will, of this company? Number two, how much investment capital is needed at the very beginning for this company? And number three, your articles of incorporation. Who's going to be included in those articles of incorporation? What actually are the articles of incorporation? So first and foremost, one of the most important decisions you can make early on as an entrepreneur, specifically as a tech entrepreneur, is your founding team. Who are your co-founders going to be? Who's going to help you get this thing off the ground? Now, a few words of caution before we have any more discussion on co-founders. Folks, finding a co-founder in business is just about the same thing as getting married. You are hitching your wagon to this person, and even if things start out, wonderful and rosy, they can go south very quickly. And so when you're choosing co-founders, specifically when you're giving equity to co-founders, which means you're giving a piece, a portion or a percentage of your company to this person. So for example, when you start the company, you're going to own 100%. If you want to bring in a partner for 10, 20 and something we never recommend, but for 50%, you're going to really want to consider, is this a person? that I can fight with, that I can have an argument with, and that we can get past that? Or is this a person that everything is rosy now and we kind of don't know each other, but we get along? It, it, you have to really figure out if this is a person that's worth getting into business with. Otherwise, what you should do is you should treat these people as employees. And let me explain how you do that. So folks, there's a couple different ways to bring people in as co-founders. Again, if you have been working with someone for 30 years or you've been best friends since childhood with someone, maybe they make a good candidate. Maybe you just met this person a few weeks ago, but you can tell that everything is going well. If that's the case, if that's the case and you want to make them an equity partner, that's something you need to discuss with your lawyer early on and say, I want to make this person a co-founder. The benefits to making someone a co-founder are oftentimes, especially for a young tech startup, you can get away because the founders, take it from me, usually when I start a new company, it's about two to three years before I'm able to take an actual salary. Usually, when you bring in a good co-founder, they're going to understand the cash constraints behind a new business, and they're going to work for free for X amount of time as long as you are as well. And so that's the trade-off you're getting. You're giving up a piece of your company oftentimes a relatively large chunk of your company, but you're bringing this person and you're getting that talent for free. And so it's a very, very strategic move to make if and only if you find the right team members and co-founders early on. Now, a lot of people ask, is there a limit to the amount of co-founders? No. In the world of tech, uh, if you had a team really of more than five or seven, honestly, on your founding team, at least for my venture capital firm that we're setting up, which is an early stage fund, We'd be very skeptical as to why so many people are on your capitalization or cap table. And pause now and look that term up if you don't know what that means. But it's oftentimes reserved that co-founder title for the first two or three people that jump on board with you. And so if you're going to have co-founders, just make sure you discuss with your lawyer what the best way to go about that is. Because there are a number of ways to bring people on as co-founders, including a term known as phantom stock, which we're not going to get into in this course, but you may want to bring up with your lawyer. So number one is co-founders. Again, remember, make sure that these people are people that are actually going to contribute to the company that you're comfortable working with and that aren't going to corrupt your organization. The next thing we need to discuss is the amount of capital needed to get this business off the ground. Now, there's a common misconception, and that's partly because entrepreneurship has become pop culture in the last few years that you need to go out and raise these crazy amounts of funding, these million, three million dollar early stage funds just to get your business off the ground, especially if it's a tech business. Now let's be clear, if that's part of your strategy, then yeah, that might be the case. But the fact of the matter is folks, for 80, 85, 90% of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial ventures, you can get these things off the ground for really as little as three or $400, whatever your incorporation fees are with your state and sometimes even less than that. 
Because when you start a business, it's all about being scrappy. It's all about being creative. How can I get someone to do this for me and I'll exchange something for them? Can I find a part-time developer that I can pay $50 for this job instead of paying $5,000 to the high-end firm? Folks, real good entrepreneurs know how to work on every single position within their organization. And by doing that, you learn every job and you save money along the way. So it may not be pretty at first, but it's very, very important to not listen to the mainstream media and to not listen to a lot of these entrepreneurial media outlets that are telling you, if you want to start a business, you need to raise X amount of dollars. That's not the case. Sure. If you are a manufacturing company or even a software company that has very high barriers to entry in business or a lot of hurdles to get there in your first couple of months, then of course it might make sense for you to say, well, in order for us to get this thing off the ground, we need about $100,000. And maybe you're lucky or fortunate enough to put that in and you have someone in your direct network that's willing to put that in, but just make sure that you actually need that money. Because a lot of times what we see with first time and early stage founders is that they get so excited by their first six-figure investment check. And I know I've been there with my first one. You get very excited by it. And what you want to do is you, you want to justify that you need that money. Oh, well, we can hire two more people or we can put more money into marketing. You can always hire more people. You can always put more money into marketing. When it comes to capital needed for an early stage business, think about the things that actually need to be done. Right, if you're in, let's take our clothing business example. Maybe you have a purchase order from a company that's willing to sell your t-shirts, your sweatshirts, whatever it may be, and you need X amount of dollars to pay a manufacturing company to print and produce those shirts so that you can then sell them. Well, then in that case, you might need that $10,000 up front because you have the purchase order for $15,000, but you need the $10,000 in starting or working capital to get this business going. So that's a great example of capital needed in a traditional business. Now let's say you're on the tech side of this and tech startup world is a whole nother giant, let's put it that way. The tech startup world, again, there's these misconceptions that you need to raise, and these terms might sound familiar to you, a seed round or a series A round, that you need to get this money into the company early on so that you can compete with the big boys, so that you can compete with the big time competitors. So a lot of times what you see is young companies going out and asking for half a million or a million dollars in a seed round or a first round of funding because they need to build their MVP or their minimum viable product, their first version of the software. They need to hire the best team right away. They need nice offices right away. And they need to pour X amount of dollars into marketing costs. Now, once again, if that's a part of your strategy and you know what you're doing on the fundraising side, then yeah, maybe that is for you. Maybe that's the case for you. But for 80 to 90% of entrepreneurs, specifically the ones that have an idea for an app, which that might be you, or an idea for a new website, or an idea for a uh, new piece of technology that ties into Microsoft Excel, whatever it might be, you'd be very surprised at how much free information is on the internet, at how much information and knowledge you can gain by spending aside or by setting aside a few hours each night during the week after work or on the weekends instead of going out to the bars and to clubs and to restaurants and teaching yourself the skills that you might need to build that by yourself. Sure, you may not pay $5,000 to a firm up front to get your first version of the software done in three weeks. Maybe it takes you three months. But hey, if you can do it yourself, if you can teach yourself to code, if you can teach yourself to make that website, if you can find a good co-founder that maybe knows how to code or that can teach you the process, Maybe you by yourself or the two of you can build that first version of your software, can build that first website or that first version of your app for zero dollars, keep all the equity in your company, not have the pressure from outside investors just yet coming down on the company. And actually, you may not need that $5,000 up front. Maybe all you need is $500 to open a bank account. And I can guarantee you, and I'm shooting myself in the foot here, because I'm about to open an early stage venture fund that puts money into young companies. Folks, we get the benefit by putting money into young companies. It does help us. We need to put money to work. And of course, when we see a company that needs it, at least at my new firm that we're opening up, that's what we want to do. We want to put money into companies that actually need it. But what we always do is we sit down with the founders. And again, I work as a venture capital consultant right now, securing early stage funding for companies before we even assess 
whether or not we're going to go out and pitch people or raise money from people. We sit there and we look at what they're using that money from, for. What are they proposing that they need that money for? And then we find all these ways to cut those costs down. And oftentimes, companies that I see firsthand that initially thought they needed to raise $300,000 realize, oh, we only need about $3,000 to get this thing off the ground. And that's an extreme case, but it draws a very serious academic point that we need to address, an exercise, if you will. Really sit there and determine what you can do by yourself or with your co-founders or with people within your network. Think about how you can swap and trade things out. Right? Entrepreneurship is the wild west, so you can make deals that don't involve cash. Think about all the creative ways that maybe you can secure some of that early stage capital. Pitch competitions, for example, are a great way to secure some of that money. Grants, scholarships. And see if you can get by on what's known as bootstrapping. Starting a company with the minimum amount of money needed to get it off the ground instead of going down the investor route right away and potentially killing your company before it gets off the ground because now you have pressure from outside investors. So these are two questions so far that you need to address before moving forward. Are you going to have co-founders? If so, make sure that they are the right co-founders for the organization, how much capital is needed, and be very certain that you actually need that capital and that you're not just dreaming about that capital. And lastly, we need to talk very briefly on um, what's known as your Articles of Incorporation. Now, your lawyer is probably going to handle this for you, and this goes more with Lesson 3, honestly, than it does with Lesson 4. But once these items are figured out, your co-founders and your money needed, or investment money needed, if you will, what you're going to have to do is put together an Articles of Incorporation that basically has rules for the organization. Who's going to be involved? How much equity do they, do they have? How much equity do the initial investors have? Who can make decisions? And you want to be very careful, folks. This is where you hear horror stories about founders that are kicked out of companies. Everybody knows about how Steve Jobs was kicked out of his organization and then he was brought back. If you want to avoid those hardships and heartaches, speak very, very clearly with your lawyer. And for a long time, it's worth the extra hour or two that they bill you on how you can protect yourself and the decision-making power within your organization by setting up a very strong Articles of Incorporation from day one. And so folks, that's lesson four. The, the, really the three important questions you have to address at this stage. Remember, lesson two, what we discussed was, is your idea worthy of being a business? Number three, if it is, how do you actually incorporate that business? And now lesson four, while you're incorporating that business or in the process of incorporating that business, if you will, Determine who is going to jump in on this venture with you on a co-founder level. How much money do you actually need? And thus, do you need investors for your organization? And then putting that all together in one nice little package called your Articles of Incorporation. If you do all that right, you should be well on your way to starting a startup or starting your first business.